My name is Will Waiting. I'm the Dean of Libraries here at North Eastern. And I have the, I think, easiest and the, probably the most pleasant task to fulfill this afternoon, which is to welcome you all here to this really splendid celebratory event where we, uh, where we celebrate the, uh, the special occasion of uh, um, the uh, Boston's Latina community and uh, the story told by the documents that we have here in the archives at Northeastern. So this is, this is an occasion, an occasion uh, of a sort that we have uh, irregularly, but when we do, we always feel we get a good turnout, and we love to see the mixture of, uh, of people from Northeastern and students and from the community. It, it in, embodies in that way something of Northeastern's approach to its relationship with the local community. And, uh, and indeed, the high value that we in the library put on our archives and the job that's done there to preserve the stories of the community. So, so without too much more ado, I'm going to, in a couple of minutes, ask my colleague, my distinguished colleague, Joan Kreisak, to do some introductions and to tell you a little about uh, who you'll be hearing from this afternoon. And I'm going to finish what I have to say by thanking, in particular, some of the sponsors of this event this afternoon who are responsible for putting together, amongst other things, the splendid food that you've all been able to enjoy. <laughs> so, so our thanks go to the libraries, of course, who uh, are hosting you here today, to NU Housing and Residential Life, to the Latino and Latina Student Cultural Center, and to the Northeastern Office of Institutional Diversity and Equity. We thank you for your sponsorship. We welcome you here today. And now I'll invite Joan to say a few words. I'm delighted that <laughs> ruining things here. Um, welcome. I'm delighted that uh, you all came to this uh, wonderful event. And uh, part of the focus of the event is to make people aware of the importance of preserving their stories, preserving the documents that tell the stories of the Latino community in Boston. And um, through the event, you can see this uh, slideshow, this um, loop that has some of the documents, just a handful of the documents that came from La Alianza Hispana collection and the EBA collection. And um, they just to give you a flavor of some of the material that we are preserving in our archives. I wanted to start by uh, telling you an anecdote of, of the use of our collections. Um, last May, um, some of you may be aware that um, our governor launched something called the Commonwealth Compact. And this was a collaboration to make Greater Boston a desired destination for people of color, immigrants, and women in the belief that their contributions will be vital to the re region's social and economic future, um, a worthy goal. So they launched this, um, this Commonwealth Compact, and part of the launch celebration was a video that was, uh, that was created for the event, especially for the event. And I got a phone call um, before the event, and um, it was from the videographer, and he was looking for images of the Latino community in Boston. And he said, do you have any? And I said, oh, yes, sure, we have images of the Latino community in Boston. And he said, oh, thank God, you are the only repository in Boston where I could find images of the Latino community. So that, that, uh, that tells you something right there. And we want, we want more images of the community. We want more records, organizational records. We want more personal papers. So if anybody out there has any ideas of organizations or people whose records we should collect, please uh, uh, contact me. Uh, now I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Nelson Merced. Um, Mr. Merced was born in New York City. After serving in the United States Navy and participating in the squatters' rights movement in San Juan, he earned a bachelor's degree in anthropology from the University of Connecticut, then came to Boston and took a job with the State Department of Public Welfare. He did graduate work at MIT in urban planning, and from 1981 to 1986,
was the deputy director of La Alianza Hispana, leaving to take the post of deputy director at the Boston Public Facilities Department. In 1988, Mr. Merced was elected to the first of two terms as a representative from the 5th Suffolk di District, becoming the first Hispanic elected to the House of Representatives in Massachusetts. During his time in the House, he served on the House on the Housing and Urban Development Committee and on the Minority Business Oversight Committee, among others. After leaving the House, Mr. Merced worked for Youth Build America as the Director of Technical Assistance. He was also involved with the Boston Foundation's Persistent Poverty Project and lectured at the University of Massachusetts. From 1994 to 1996, he served as CEO of EVA. In 1999, Mr. Merced became New England Regional Director of NeighborWorks, a national nonprofit organization created by Congress to provide financial support, technical assistance, and training for community for community-based revitalization efforts. Since 2004, Mr. Mer Merced has been NeighborWorks Director of National Initiatives and Applied Research. Mr. Merced. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Will and Joan, uh, especially Rebecca, who has been making sure that I got here. Uh, I, I, I actually I spoke to Rebecca last night and said, "Well, you know, what are you expecting me to talk about?" And she says, "Well, you know, there's lots of stories in the Latino community. You should talk about some of the stories that are there. Talk about what you're doing now, and talk about you know some of the things that happened when you were here." Uh, I'd like to uh, talk about a period of time, really, uh, between 1981 and 1992. And a lot of things happened in those 11 to 12 years, uh, some uh, essential for the Latino community, uh, some uh, that have become national models uh, for community activism. Uh, and you'll recognize the names of some of these events and some of these activities as I go through them. It's a long period of time, so I'm gonna be, and they only gave me 10, 15 minutes, so I, I figure that <laughs> I'm gonna talk really fast. I'll talk really fast, and, and, uh, and I also uh, am very proud uh, to be on the same platform with Janet, who's the current executive director of La Alianza Hispana, and Vanessa, who's the current executive director of EBA, if you, you know, I was the executive director of both of those organizations at one point. Um, so, uh, uh, and they're much better than I am uh, at the time. So, than I was at the time. Uh, I want to tell a little story before, so you know a little bit about me, uh, other than what, you know, you see in the documents and stuff like that. Uh, when I was about 22 or 23, I got involved in a squatters movement in Puerto Rico, and they... I think it's mentioned in the bio that Joan read. And the squatters movement was called Villa Margarita. Uh, my, current, my wife at the time uh, was pregnant, and we were homeless uh, at the time, and you know, basically staying over with my uh, parents, and that was pretty uncomfortable. Uh, and so uh, we got involved in this movement uh, to take over this piece of land in Trujillo Alto. Uh, that subsequently got called Villa Margarita. And uh, it was about 400 families came in, took over about 40 acres of land. They all built their shacks uh, because that's what they were. And then later on, it became a, a whole community, but at the time, it was shacks. Uh, and one of the interesting challenges that we had as we were growing as a community was to try to figure out how to get water and electricity. And just to indicate how naive I was at the time, I knew a little bit about electricity uh, from my Navy days and decided that the best way to get electricity to this community was to get a truck, lift the back of the truck up to the, to the wires, the cables, the electrical cables, and connect electricity to the community doing that. Mm -hmm. And I just, I knew enough not to touch the two wires at the same time. <laughs> and luckily, I'm still here. So uh, just to know that uh, you know, when you're young, you are pretty naive, and you do risky things. But at the end of the day, 
it works out uh, for the better sometimes. Well, at least for me, it worked out for the better, right? I didn't get electrocuted, and I'm still around. Uh, I want to uh, briefly touch on basically three te themes that I want you to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, one is the question of vision. Uh, and as you, are, as students here, uh, graduate, uh, you know, one of the things that's important in your career is actually developing some, developing some sort of vision for yourself. And then when you get involved in things, you want to have a vision for, uh, for what it is that you're trying to be involved in. The second thing that I, that I think is important for us to recognize in this process is institution building. And one of the things that the Latino community has been about for the last 30 years has been institution building in Boston. And so, you know, Alianza Hispana and Eva are two key examples, but not the only examples of institution building. And I'm going to mention some others. And the last thing that I think is really important that's a sort of a thread throughout this work was the question of uh, the importance and essential, uh, uh, essential part of uh, the importance of collaboration, coalition building, credibility, and hope. Uh, so when, when you look at uh, what we accomplished and some of the things that we didn't accomplish, but what we accomplished, I think, all of those three sort of themes come through. And I'll, I'll just basically begin with vision. Uh, in the early, when, when I became the executive director of La Alianza Hispana, one of the things that I was confronted with was tremendous amount of vacant land and abandonment in this community. And so when I negotiated, I had just been, I was just almost graduated from MIT, and I got recruited to be the executive director. I said, well, you know, I'd like to spend a little bit of time doing some community development work. And the board at the time was uh, basically under receivership uh, from uh, uh, United Way. And uh, they were anxious to agree to anything as long as they were able to get me to say yes to being the executive director. I don't know why. I didn't have any experience as an executive director. And five years prior to this, I had applied for a youth development job, and they didn't even interview me at Alianza Hispana. So uh, I, don't, I don't understand why they would then give me a job of executive director, but they did. Um, and one of the things that, uh, one of the first things that we were able to do is get an MIT studio to come in, uh, and it was a director, the, uh, the faculty member at MIT in the planning department was Tony Lee, and he had a group of students that uh, on an annual basis, on a semester basis, would do a studio. And so I convinced him that this would be a great place to do a studio. And that studio really set the groundwork for a lot of the stuff that you currently see. I mean, if you look back at some of those documents, and I think the documents, some of, this thing, some of these things are in the archive, I think, uh, because I gave, I gave the archives a lot of boxes, but I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> You know, at the end of the day, I wasn't sure. I think when Joan and I talked a while ago, she said, just give me the boxes, and we'll sort through them. And I said, okay, well, that's what we'll do. Um, but that document and that help from the students, and I, I want to emphasize, they were students. Really, they were the labor force, really, that I needed at the time, because there was no way that I could do that work. There was nobody at Alianza, really, with the skills to have it take a broad look at the community. And they developed this document from the ground up, called From the Ground Up. And that really provided a real good document for me to work from over the next five years to be able to do some work. The second thing, when just a year before, uh, a year before we started working on the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, uh, we had what was called, again, a connection that we had with MIT, uh, Don Sean and Joel Kamai, uh, whose name will come up a little later, uh, who uh, is a faculty member, was a faculty member at MIT and now is a faculty member at, uh, at um, uh, Southern New Hampshire University. Uh, he, they offered to sponsor what's called a search conference. And a search conference is you bring a bunch of, you select a bunch of people from the neighborhood, you bring them together at a retreat, and you do a process in which people imagine what the community can look like in the future. Not for any purpose 
as, you know, not to develop an agenda, not to develop uh, a work plan, but just to develop among those people a unitary vision of what the community could look like. And that really served as the underpinnings, uh, and many of the people that are involved in the, in the uh, that were eventually involved in the uh, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative actually don't recognize that that was an underpinning because it occurred a year before. Mm -hmm. And it served as a, as a way for us to sort of understand what needed to happen in the Dudley area for us to be able to uh, do the development that needed to happen. And, you know, I don't know if, any, if you're familiar with the Dudley Street neighborhood area. There was a lot of abandonment. There was acres and acres in the late 60s. There were fires throughout the neighborhood. It was one of those places in the, in the Boston area in which there was tremendous number of fires, a lot of vacant land. A lot of parcels that are owned by individuals uh, and very difficult to deal with and obviously not a big priority for the city or for the folks uh, in those communities. Um, the second, the third item that I think, and, and this, is a, this is the question of vision, again, just to remind you because of what we're doing, and if you see, you see a theme here, right, it's connected to the universities, the students, there's faculty, that's an important role. Uh, for us in the community to have a real strong linkage with the universities. The third item is the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative Plan. And that was basically, you know, once we got over the initial organizing process, then the community hired some consultants who then worked with the community to develop a plan for that neighborhood. Uh, and then lastly, uh, in terms of vision, uh, was uh, the effort around redistricting that ended up creating the, the district in which I was able to run as a state representative. And that was an effort, uh, again, another person I just met, Joel Camay, who was basically leading the effort on the part of the uh, Latino Democratic Committee at the time, working with the black uh, political task force, really got together and said uh, at one of the redistricting uh, intersections which happen every 10 years at the time it happened every fifth year on the leap year where the state legislature would change the district boundaries and the folks in the black political task force and the Latino Democratic Committee what they were trying to do is create the possibilities of another minority another district in which a minority person could get elected and in the process of doing this effort they basically came to an agreement that if there was a viable Latino candidate, that they would all support it. Uh, and that was essential, and that, again, takes vision, because you're, you're looking into the future, you're trying to figure out, okay, what are the things that you need to do in the future uh, in, order to, in order for you to be able to accomplish what you want to accomplish uh, without, you know, without a guidepost, without a map, you know, basically, any road will get you there because you're not going anywhere. But you know, with some with some ideas very concretely stated and researched, you know, there's you can make some progress against those ideas. It gives you a guideline. The second uh, theme is the question of institution building. And uh, as I said at the beginning, um, you know, the Latino community has been for the last 30 to 40 years about institution building. And, you know, the, one of the biggest and most important institutions, two of the most biggest and important institutions are here today, La Nias Hispana, which at the time, and I haven't talked to Janet recently about where their programs are, but I, I imagine it's still probably the biggest Latino social service agency in the state of Massachusetts, probably in New England. Um, and, uh, and EVA, which was an organization that really sort of set the bar in terms of, eco in terms of housing and, eco and community development uh, in the South End. And those were two organizations in which the Latino community had to fight against the powers that be in order to build institutions that have permanency. Because, you know, one thing is for you to work on a project, the project has ended, it's over. Another thing is to be able to come here to this event and look back and say, gee, Alianza has been around for 30 years, Eva has been around for 30 years, probably more, right? Um, um, 
And they've had leaderships, they've employed people, they've implemented projects, they've done research, they've done all of the things that you need to do in order for uh, you to have a level of development with the community that you would need. You need institutions to be able to implement those things. And one of the things, obviously, one of the, some of the things that came out of uh, Alianza, uh, which is the area that I want to focus on, uh, was the first institution that came out of La Alianza, and the Alianza, first of all, what we did in Alianza was stabilize it because it was very unstable, it was losing a lot of money, and so one of the things that I, that I did was, you know, really focus in what's its programs, you know, what kind of development we need to do, what's the priorities, what's the strategic plan, how do you do a fundraising development. But then after that, we, like I said, we had a lot of abandonment in this community, so we established Nuestra Comunidad Development Corporation. And that corporation was the corporation was the corporation was established as a partnership between La Alianza Hispana and the Hispanic Office of Planning and Evaluation, who worked together to establish that organization. Now that organization owns about a thousand units of housing, uh, has property all over the place. Uh, you know, it's it provides housing in the community for the community. And it wasn't exclusively Latino, even though it has a Latino name. Uh, but you know, the objective was to create an institution that could provide some housing and to develop the, uh, to uh, fill in the spaces that were completely abandoned. Um, the other institution that Alianza founded was Casa Esperanza, which is an alcohol recovery home. It was the first alcohol recovery home. Uh, in the Latino community, there was a large problem that may still continue to be large problems with substance abuse, especially alcohol. And the, and the uh, Casa Esperanza was the vision of, uh, of, of a guy that was a staff person at Alianza, whose name was Rick Quiroga, uh, whose name is Rick Quiroga. And uh, you know, he worked at Alianza, he came to me and he said, you know, we need an alcohol recovery home because I work and I get them to this point and then I can't do anything more with them. And so we started working on the alcohol recovery home and through his efforts and, and a coalition of people, we were able to establish uh, Casa Esperanza in that neighborhood. And they've grown and prospered. Uh, the third institution I think that Alianza was involved in, and so was Nuestra after we built, sorry, after we built Nuestra, was uh, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. And that was a collaborative of a number of organizations uh, in, in and around the Dudley area who, even, even though we were all working on different aspects of community development, it wasn't really resulting in much. Uh, and so, through our efforts, we came together and we, you know, the, the, one of the key concepts that came out of that uh, search conference was a concept called a Constitution for Development uh, that came out of that search conference document. And that was, a, that was an essential idea when we established the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative as a way of figuring out, okay, what needs to be done and how do we collaborate? Because this was not an exclusive Latino community. It had Cape Verdeans, African Americans, white, and we needed to bring them all together, all the institutions that were involved with them together to come up with some priority lists and to come up with a plan of attack for that and to get the city to pay attention uh, to this Dudley Street area, which, you know, when you look at it, a map, it's like a triangle. Um, and it was completely abandoned for a long time. Uh, and the last institution I think that's important that was, you know, lasted very short, uh, was the Nelson Merced campaign uh, to get elected, to have Nelson Merced, myself, get elected uh, to state representative. But, you know, all of that builds on, all of this, Bills on the fact that me and a lot of other people, and I and I want to I want to lay I don't want to lay claim to having single-handedly done any of this or single-handedly even thought of any about about any of this. I'm just single-handedly now summarizing it. Uh, uh, but in reality, it took the efforts of a lot of different people uh, uh, to make. Uh, to make this, and that's the last point, right? Collaboration, coalition building, uh, building credibility, and hope. 
And one of the issues about, and I wanted to start just with the credibility. I mean, one of the reasons why I think I was able to succeed in the Nelson Merced campaign to get elected for state representative is that I had spent a lot of time just working with a lot of different people and building that credibility. So that when we went out into the community uh, to get people to vote uh, for myself for that state representative seat, and there was six other candidates, there was five other candidates, you know, we were able to prevail in that process. Uh, and so it's not, it wasn't just a victory for the Latino community, although it was a victory for the Latino community, but when you look at the time, the Latino community in that neighborhood, in that district, was only 10% of the population. It was 40% African American and 50% white. And so, or was it 50% African American, 40% white? Anyway, the, the fact of the matter was that in order for myself to get elected in this position, we had to build a coalition. We had to have, the campaign had to have credibility. The credibility came from the fact that we did all of this work in that community. And people in that community recognized that work as work that was important to them and work that was important for the development of that community. And, uh, you know, the coalition building process is an institution on itself. It's a, it has its own dynamics. It has its own uh, ways of, of, um, of, of developing. And it's a, basically, I would say it's a science for those folks. And, and we saw the proof of that with the election of, uh, of President Obama, who built a coalition nationally to be able to get elected. And, you know, who in there... Who would have thought at the beginning of this process that an African American could become president of the United States? I certainly didn't, although I supported Obama. Uh, but, I mean, it took vision, it took institution building his campaign and, it, and the ongoing work, and it took, you know, a lot of credibility and coalition building. So, you know, I think the themes, the themes and the work that has been done in over that period of time, 1981, to 1982 is important because it demonstrated that the communities and, and, one, and one of the things that I mentioned before is that national models. The Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative is a national model for community building now. And it's used, it's replicated. Uh, not too long ago I gave a presentation to a class at the University of Maryland. Uh, there's been presentations throughout the country about what it takes to build a coalition so that you can make, you know, differences in your community and make real differences in the community in, ter in terms of building cohesiveness and in terms of rebuilding uh, some of the tattered fra uh, fabrics of those communities. Uh, and so uh, all of these things are part of the archives, I think. Again, I gave a bunch of boxes, but I am sure that there's three three different camp election campaigns in there, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative stuff is in there, the Search Conference stuff is in there, the MIT st Studio stuff is in there, plus a bunch of other stuff. Um, and I think that, you know, in the future when people go through that, they'll see that there's, uh, you know, especially when we archive La Alianza Hispana's uh, work uh, and others that you might be able to find, you know, uh, researchers in the future will be able to sell that story uh, about what happened in this community and how it made a difference. And so not too long ago, another story, not too long ago I was driving through the community since I no longer live in Massachusetts. And I was giving somebody that had never been to Massachusetts a tour. We were going to a meeting and I said, well, why don't we just go through here and go through Roxbury. And, and I stopped on Dudley Street, on the, Dudley, on the corner of Dudley Street and West Cottage Street. And I was amazed that there was a you know, a six, seven story building that's now on Dudley Street where, you know, it used to be a vacant lot. And now it's beginning to, you know, form after, you know, we're talking now 20 years, 20 years, uh, this is the uh, 21st year of all of this effort. Uh, after all of those years, the community, you know, the fabric along Blue Hills is being rebuilt and it takes that long. I just wanted to mention because I'm gonna go into another section briefly of what I'm doing now, uh, but it takes that long uh, for you, for a community really to re, 
uh, establish itself over time. And I mean, Alianza, Eva is a clear example of that prior to uh, the things that we did at Alianza and taking a lot from the example that, that Eva, that the history of Eva uh, demonstrates to everybody. It's how do you rebuild a community in a way that really supports the community and, and builds, uh, you know, supports the community, builds in culture, builds in another, another key elements. What are the problems that they face? Well, Vanessa can, say, can, say, can tell you about that if she, if she cares. But I just wanted to uh, uh, talk a little bit. There's in the archives, uh, besides those documents, there's also, you know, the legislative work that I did. Uh, and also, I think, uh, I was part of this National Commission on Immigration Reform. Uh, we call it the Barbara Jordan Commission, uh, who was a congressman. Barbara Jordan was an African-American congressman woman from Texas. Uh, she was the president, uh, she was the chairperson of this commission. But we did a lot of work over this period of time and to 1997. I was a member of that commission around the issues of immigration. And I bet you that over the next four to eight years, a lot of the work that we did in that commission is going to come back uh, as as information for any of the future immigration reform issues that we're going to be facing. Uh, right now, I'm the director of National Initiatives and Applied Research at NeighborWorks America. It's a national organization. I started at NeighborWorks almost 10 years ago as the director of the New England District, and now I'm the director of National Initiatives. And uh, we do a number of things, mostly focused on housing and uh, housing development, home ownership development. Uh, right now, for the last five years, we've been working on the issue of foreclosures. And now, and uh, uh, five years ago, we established the Center for Foreclosure Solutions. Uh, we saw uh, from our affiliate in Chicago, somebody's going to have to tell me when the hook is, right? Somebody take it. Somebody keep the time. Because I'm not keeping time, and I can talk for a long time. Uh, um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, uh, foreclosure is a, an issue that can really destroy all of the work that a lot of us have done over the last, you know, 30 years, 40 years. Uh, we've worked, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out strategies for allowing people to become homeowners and to improve communities. And now, and as a consequence of, uh, of, uh, of actions of uncontrolled greed and profit uh, from a lot of, of, uh, of banks and brokers, uh, mortgage brokers, we now have a situation in which a lot of communities around the country, and you're in, you're in uh, Boston, so you feel it somewhat, but there are communities literally in which acres and acres and acres and acres of that community are completely abandoned. Houses that were built are completely gone. Youngstown, Ohio, for example, had a population uh, 10 years ago, a population of 125,000 people. They're now down to like 78,000 people. And that's happening throughout the country. Part of that has been this issue of foreclosures. The consequences of foreclosures, and you know, we've been working on trying to figure out how to prevent it, how to get the banks to do more work with residents. We established a 800 number uh, to allow people to call in. Uh, NeighborWorks established an 800 number to allow people to work, uh, call in. They think they have a problem to get at least one hour of counseling and then get referred to a community-based counseling agency. Um, and um, uh, uh, the consequence of this foreclosure is now what we're calling an effort that we're leading uh, on community stabilization. Because I think, you know, we can try to stop it, and we are, and we're working with lots of people to try to make sure, you know, to get the banks to uh, redo their mortgages, to uh, uh, try to stop the foreclosure process, to get people at least some stopgap measures to keep themselves in, the, in their homes. and. Uh, it started with a lot of unscrupulous lending. Now it's just the general economy that's, uh, that's really putting people at risk. Uh, but the consequences of communities that com are completely abandoned, once again. And, uh, you know, a lot of you probably 
you know, maybe 21, 22. Some of us are a little older. Uh, you know, there are parts of the Bronx, for example, uh, Roxbury, in which the consequences, the uh, the consequences of abandonment. I see the hook. <laughs> the, the consequences of abandonment is really detrimental to the community, and we have to take action. And so now uh, we have formed an unprecedented coalition at the national level between the local initiative support corporation list, the National Enterprise Corporation, uh, NaveWorks America, and, uh, and HPN to create a national mechanism to be able to try to get these properties quickly into the hands of community folks so that they can renovate and rebuild. In addition to that, NaveWorks America is working with national nonprofits around the issues of strength, getting, you know, figuring out how to strengthen national nonprofits working in the area of, of development, of housing development and community development. And lastly, one of the priorities in my division is also a, an effort around what's called success measures, which is providing mechanisms and tools for local community-based organizations to be able to document how successful they are in the work that they're doing, which is the hardest thing, trying to get grants for the community, is the hardest thing is to demonstrate that you're successful. And we develop a mechanism called success measures that really allows the organizations to document what they're doing and how well it's impacting the community. So lastly, uh, I just wanted to say uh, again, thank you all for having invited me. Uh, the themes of vision, having a vision, of building institutions uh, that make a difference over a long period of time, and uh, being able to take an attitude of collaboration and coalition building are the essential things that we need uh, going forward if we want to continue to have a strong community-based movement and strong community influence. Thank you. to be here tonight and have each and every one of you here, especially having the students. It's wonderful to, to say, and we want to have students, but to have them actually here is just tremendous. Um, in addition to having Nelson Merced here, I have the pleasure of introducing two very special individuals. And I'm going to introduce them um, as they take their seats on the panel so you can get, um, so they can get situated and then I can kind of give you a little bit of background about this event and why it was put together. Um, the Latino Student Cultural Center, which is located on Forsyth Street, I don't know if any of you had, have had a chance to come visit us, is, is open um, and ready for any of you to come in and we provide a, a variety of service and pro services and programs. I'm the assistant director there. Uh, my name is Rebecca Veda and I work with Rosa Rodriguez Williams, who is the director, and two other colleagues that, that are here tonight, um, Sara and Rosita. Um, thank you again for all, being, for, for all of you for being here. Um, to give you a background, when we found out about Nessa Merced's papers being um, published and, and archived here at our library, I just thought what a wonderful opportunity for us to invite him and, uh, and share his experiences in addition to showing the fruit of, of work in the community and just to show our students how much being involved in their community can, can elevate them to a position like his. And the other two individuals that I'm going to introduce, you will also see um, being Latinas, um, it's just tremendous to see them overcome so many obstacles to be where they are today. Um, so if the panels don't mind, please, having a seat, and I'll introduce um, the two other panelists. I know Nelson's also a panelist as well. We're very proud to have him continuing on with us this evening. Thank you so much. To start out, um, with Vanessa Calderon Rosado. I'm going to introduce her and um, she'll have a chance to speak after I introduce her and then I will introduce um, the, the next panelist just so that um, Vanessa has a chance to speak before um, she has to leave. Dr. Vanessa Calderon Rosado um, is the Chief Executive Officer of Inquilinos Puricos en Acción. It's a Boston-based community action organization founded in 1968 to develop low and moderate income housing, to also provide support services to families and promote and preserve Latino artistic expression. Prior to being the CEO, she serves as the Director of Operations for 
inquilinos por ingreso en acción. She, is, she was the assistant pro professor at Boston University in the School of Social Work, room, in, in the school of social work. Um, as a Puerto Rican born on the island, Dr. Calderon Rosado is committed to advancing policy issues that affect Latinos and other underserved populations. She received her doctorate in public policy on aging and gerontology um, at the University of, Bath of Massachusetts, Boston. Gracias y buenas tardes a todos. Uh, gracias por estar aquí, sobre todo los estudiantes. Siempre es una inspiración para mí, especialmente porque yo estuve muchos años en el ambiente académico, de ver un salón tan lleno de estudiantes, porque eso demuestra el interés que todos ustedes tienen en aprender un poco más de su, de su comunidad y cómo seguir envueltos en su comunidad. So, muchas gracias, los felicito. Well, now in English, or actually I'm done now. <laughs> well, I, uh, I want to thank this opportunity. This is a great opportunity to be here tonight. I want to thank the students. That's basically what I said, first of all, for being here. It shows, to see how many students here tonight shows a really strong interest, not only in your uh, in our communities, but also on how you can get involved along the theme that Nelson mentioned on how you really have a vision and become involved in your communities and make an impact and a difference. So thank you very much. Thank you to Joan and Rebecca for the invitation, the kind invitation to be here tonight. And everyone who uh, was involved in putting this event together. Uh, I know that these events take a lot of behind the scenes work and I don't know who those people are, but I'm sure you did uh, a lot of work and it obviously shows. And last but not least, I'm, ha I'm having a great time here tonight uh, being next to Nelson, who really is a role model for all of us in the younger generation of Latino leaders in, in the city of Boston. Even though he's no longer in the city, he definitely is always available when I call. He calls back <laughs> and listens and provides a sound advice. And also next to Janet, uh, you know, a peer and colleague who uh, works very hard and really is making a big difference in La Vianza and the neighborhood and community and uh, people that they serve. So this is a great honor and pleasure. And uh, tonight, I have to excuse myself, I have an Eva board meeting tonight at 6 o'clock, so I have to leave here by 5.30. So I may have to leave before the panel is uh, concluded, which is a shame because I really wanted to hear everything that everyone had to say, but hopefully that will be the case. Well, I want to start by saying that I believe that today's topic is not only relevant, but it's important. Uh, there's uh, an undeniably uh, truth that the Latino community is the fastest growing population, not only in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but all over the United States of America. So it's about time that we start having these conversations and start uh, highlighting the contributions that uh, organizations like La Alianza and Eva, and actually the community who formed them, who are the true uh, uh, heroes here and, and heroines in, in this work that are recognized and that we start thinking about how do we continue to carry on that work and continue to build upon it. Because we're, we're standing, believe me, we're standing and when you hear a little bit more about the history of Eva and Villa Victoria, you'll see how proud we all should feel, especially myself standing on the shoulders of so many people before me and really putting together a very strong community-based organization as, as Eva is. So today I will focus uh, my remarks on three key topics. Uh, um, I will tell you a little bit about the history of Inquilinos Boricuas en Acción, IVA, and what IVA means in English. Uh, I, and obviously of the community of Villa Victoria, the core community that IVA serves today and over the course of the past 41 years. I also will tell you about the work and the mission that IVA uh, continues to do and has done over the course of these past 41 years. And last but not least, why is it important for us to have this conversation tonight about preserving the history and, us, and the stories of our communities and our organizations? So uh, let me begin a little bit with the history of Eva. And in fact, as you, as you listen uh, and you take a look at the PowerPoint presentation, there's a 
pay attention to one that comes right after the little girl dress in the bomba uh, uh, costume uh, because there's a, a drawing of the Villa Victoria community there and because I will refer to that eventually so, so I don't have to be you know, looking back all the time because it will continue to, to roll so pay attention to that one particular slide. Uh, so how did Eva start? It? Well, it all started as a, you know as the result of the struggle in the 1960s of um, co a community mm -hmm. that lived in the South End who really was facing the threat of being displaced. Um, at the time, there were you know the urban renewal plans all across the United States, uh, new money coming into the urban centers to infuse. Uh, dollars and resources into kind of depressed or underserved areas of uh, inner city uh, locations, including Boston. The South End was slated to be one of those uh, communities that were going to get an infusion of money for uh, new residential and commercial development. Oops, you cannot see the Villa Victoria slide anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's coming. Uh, so, uh, as part of that movement, uh, the BRA, the Boston Real Development Authority, had developed plans for this new uh, development, residential and commercial development in the South End. At the time, they had designated that part of the <coughs> South End Parcel 19. So, uh, Parcel 19 and its surroundings was house home at the time of uh, two to 3,000 Puerto Ricans. Uh, low-income families, working families, uh, people that came from the island with very, many of them with very low levels of education, uh, including some people who were illiterate. So th we're talking about a really poor, disengaged, underserved, and forgotten community at the time. So, uh, but they did not like the plans that the VRA had of displacing them. The community, very similar to what uh, Nerson uh, described in the 80s around the Dudley Square area, the community of the South End was a dilapidated community. A lot of burned and abandoned buildings and vacated lots. It was not the kind of community that you, we have today in Villa Victoria. But obviously, even though it was not the prettiest of communities and not the most resourced one, that group of Puerto Rican that lived there decided that they will not move that they wanted to stay, that that was their neighborhood, that that was their community, that their families and friends lived there and that's where they belonged. So they mobilized the community and organized uh, against the, to fight the threat of being displaced from the community. And around the rally of No nos mudaremos de la parcela 19, we shall not be moved from parcel 19, they organized the community and really mobilized them to stop the plans of the BRA, at least to give them enough grievance and, 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 and heartache and, and, and pain to kind of stop the plans and start listening to the community. And they, they started voicing their plans as a vision, again, going back to Nelson's themes, the vision of what they wanted to see in that community, what that community meant to them and how they wanted to see it develop. So uh, with that vision in mind, they, uh, that they created these beautiful plans to develop a whole new community that including brownstones, we'll get there, and including brownstones that kind of married or combined the architecture of the South End with the brick row houses, but also the casitas of Puerto Rico, you know, the uh, little mountaintop houses of Puerto Rico with the stock and the pastel colors. And if you go to Via Victoria, that is what you see today. And I will invite you all to come. I will tell, tell you more about that later. Uh, so they, but in order to make that vision a reality and to create uh, that uh, opportunity for their, their families and their community, they needed to in institutionalize something. They needed to build an institution that would represent and carry on that vision and implement it. So EBA was born. In 1968, uh, our original name was Emergency Tenants Council of Parcel 19. And uh, later in 1973, in fact, this is all information that is in the archives, because I've read it there too, uh, they changed the name to Inquilinos Boricuas in Acción, which translated to, to English would be Puerto Rican Tenants in Action, IBA. So once they established the organization, they institutionalized 
the, their opportunity to make their vision a reality, they began the development process. And uh, they created you know, the townhomes, uh, they created plazas, thinking of you know, the Puerto Rican plazas, and, and Latin America too, and Spain, you know, where that becomes the heart of the community, where people come and gather and hang out, and children play while older uh, elderly play dominoes or interact with each other, or listen to music, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they created a community also with streets that were one-way street, horseshoe shape. So they will create a community that only really people that will li that live in Villa Victoria or come to visit will drive through those streets. So when you go to Villa Victoria, even though it's not a uh, controlled access community, it almost feels like it because it's really kind of very, almost like the island of Puerto Rico, an island in itself, <coughs> in the middle of the south end. So that development took, obviously, a number of years over the course of the following 20 years or so, uh, which is, again, along with the things that Nelson mentioned, that it takes, you know, once this vision is established, it takes a long time to really unfold it and make it happen, make it a reality. Uh, so they developed four properties within the Villa Victoria community that comprise today our 435 units of affordable housing, rental housing, low-income housing. And then they also developed other uh, pieces of, of property uh, for other organizations around Villa Victoria, including the Boston Housing Authority, turnkey properties, in which they built an elderly and disabled building right next to our plaza, and that is part of the community, even though it's not owned by EVA or our affiliate ETC Development Corporation. So the cool thing about this, and it's really intriguing and exciting, especially for me, a Puerto Riqueña, who was not born here and didn't take part of that movement, is to see in that process of stopping the VRA, of creating the plans, of developing that vision and implementing the vision by building an institution, the forward thinking of the community, you know, how they really went way ahead of the time in thinking what is that we want to see. We not only want to build buildings, we not only want to build the brick and mortars and have houses for our families that are better than the ones that we had. We want to have houses, we want to have programs, we want to have services, we want to serve our children, we want to serve our young people, we want to serve our elderly, we want to serve our families. So that is what EVA does today, providing to all that community and beyond in the South and Lower Roxbury, a number of social and artistic programs to really empower them. Our mission uh, is to, to and continue to build that social capital. Our mission today, 41 years later, is to increase the social and economic power of individuals and families in four areas, education, economic development, technology, and the arts. So in each one of those four areas, we have a number of programs. We have a preschool program, Escuelita Boriquen, which happens to be the first bilingual program, preschool program in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So a lot of firsts with EVA. Um, we have an after-school program, Cacique after-school program. We have a very strong youth program, the Cacique Youth Learning Center, providing youth arts education, leadership development, health education, and a number of other things. And Lisa who was part of that program a few summers ago. Uh, and actually, some of you have participated in other capacities in some way, shape, or form. We also have a technology center, and I will tell you more about that in a second when I talk about that forward-thinking vision. Uh, we have a resident, resident and elderly services and family services information referral advocacy for the families and elderly that we serve and who live in Villa Victoria. Uh, we have a strong collaboration with Bunker Hill Community College to provide adult education, GED programs, and a pathway to college. So we do have some college courses in, right in the heart of Villa Victoria. And last but not least, we have our arts programs. And I have some information here that I will leave behind for you. If you want more, go to our website. We have a lot of cultural events. We've talked to Rebecca before. So a lot of information stuff, fun stuff, and cultural stuff that I will invite you to come. But about the forward-thinking vision, El Bate Technology Center, a technology center, was at the time when it was created, it was not a technology center. Computers obviously were not where they are today. So, uh, so uh, inevitable in a way for all of us and so needed. But uh, that space particularly was our uh, TV station. It was, uh, they decided that they, the Puerto Ricans that uh, designed the community decided that they wanted to have a closed circuit to the station, kind of a 
cable access almost, but just for the community of Villa Victoria, and it was on access through channel sticks. So through that TV station, they got into the living rooms of each one of the, of the residents to show, you know, talk about health issues, community issues, arts programs, youth programs. So they had a very budding, and that's why the arts is, still is, it has been and still is such an important part of the work that we do because we see our arts as a tool to develop community power, as a tool to really bring communities together. Uh, and, and also to take pride on our history and all and origins and also our roots. Uh, so they, they had that vision of, of creating that station. Eventually that funding dried up. That was not obviously with the genesis of cable TV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of dwindled. Eventually that uh, TV station and the cabling, all the wiring that they did at the time to develop the TV station became our technology center and became a very cutting edge <coughs> movement in which we wired all of the units of Villa Victoria to provide high speed uh, internet access to the residents. That now also has dwindled because we cannot compete with Comcast or uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Verizon. But at the time, it was another cutting edge movement you know, in bringing you know, internet access to a low income housing community. So what they did in 1968, they didn't even think of a a tremendous repercussions of that forward thinking, that vision that they had in, at the time. So uh, that brings us to today. So what do we do? I told you a little bit about our admission and our work. And uh, over the course of the past five years, we've done a lot of accomplishments. We've been able to strengthen our organization, to make it grow, to make it more efficient, to uh, so we better support and sustain our programs uh, and, and have better systems for raise the necessary funds so we can not only continue to sustain our programs but grow and serve more and more people at EVA. Uh, we have one of our accomplishments with that wonderful history that I just talked to you about is that we have become a model for community development, not only across in, in the United States but across, you know, uh, across borders. Just two years ago, we had a, a visit from a delegation from Northern Ireland as they are rebuilding neighborhoods in Belfast that were uh, completely derailed by the, 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 the war and, and the, the you know, Protestant Catholic conflict. They're looking at models and they came to visit Villa Victoria to see what have you done, what kind of things we can learn so we can implement that. So it tells you how, you know, remember that group of Puerto Ricans I told you about low income? low levels of education, look at what they did. We, and as I mentioned earlier, we're standing in really strong shoulders. And the idea here, and that's why I'm so proud to be here tonight, is because I hope that in one way, shape, or form, all of you become involved, look at the archives, get more in tune on the history of these organizations and how you can really get more involved and make an impact in the community the way you know, these people did it 41 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Now, that's all nice and beautiful, but we have a number of challenges that I want to talk to you very briefly about. One of the things that we uh, have experienced in the past 10 years or so is clearly gentrification. How many of you are familiar with the South End? Okay, many, good. So you know, as well as I do, that the South End has rapidly changed. It has become definitely more diverse, and uh, it has, uh, you know, the, the socioeconomic strata in the South End has also changed dramatically and become much more diverse with many more people, uh, young professionals and uh, upper middle class and, and, and upper class people, income people moving into our neighborhood. That has uh, created you know, a number of challenges for us as a community. Uh, we have uh, lost a number of bodegas in the last few years. Just um, seven months ago, we lost a very small mom and pop restaurant that was right there in the heart of the community. So, you know, many of those ancillary institutions around Villa Victoria have been either eroded or completely gone, eliminated from this gentrification uh, process. We, Villa Victoria is strong, and Nerson talked about permanency, and we are permanent. We're there to stay, and we will stay. 
we shall not be moved from parcel 19 and we will not. But, or in this case now, Villa Victoria. But clearly there's, you know, there are all the issues, obviously when you then have so many different strata in the social economic status of a community, you begin having the conflicts that are, natu that naturally come with that, uh, those differences. And, you know, people really drawing away from each other. And in the past three years, we've made concerted efforts to really engage neighborhood associations. The South End, unlike any other neighborhood in the city of Boston, is very unique because in about one square mile has 14 housing developments, both private and public, plus I don't know how many neighborhood associations. The South End, I think, has a neighborhood association per street or per <laughs> block or something that, that ridiculous in a way. So we have been definitely reaching out, especially to the abutting neighborhood associations to work more collaboratively because we were getting a lot of backslash about that, especially in 2005 when uh, violence spiked up in the city of Boston. You know, the neighbors, the, our abutting neighbors, you know, our, our abutters, started, oh, let's do neighborhood crime watch. So let's, you know, all those kids. People would come to me, it's like, your people, did this, and it's like, how do you know they're residents of Villa Victoria? Well, they were speaking Spanish, and it's like, I speak Spanish, I don't live in Villa Victoria. Well, I don't sleep in Villa Victoria, I live there, I don't sleep there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we were really experiencing that kind of backlash, and we needed to, we felt the need to really reach out and really start having dialogues. We're not there yet, clearly, but uh, we have felt that it's necessary for us to really engage our young people and our elderly and really showcase the kind of work that we do to debunk those, uh, and I got the hook too. <laughs> so, um, two other challenges, um, the demographic shift of Villa Victoria and the area. Uh, Villa Victoria always had Asians and uh, African Americans, but now our composition is, you know, we were pretty much 90% Puerto Rican slash Latino. Now we are about 70% Latino because we're mixed, and of that, still the majority is Puerto Rican. We have about 15% African American, and growing fast, about 12%, 12 percent, uh, 12 percent, almost yeah, growing to 15, 12 percent Asian, Chinese, Mandarin-speaking Chinese. And that comes as a result of the gentrification of Chinatown itself, and people moving out of Chinatown, and next up is Villa Victoria. So that represents a challenge for us and how do we reach out to this new community, how we diversify, how do we welcome them, how do we work ourselves with our own uh, race and ethnic differences, etc. And last but not least, and um, I wish we would have more time to talk about this, but there's a, there has been also a shift uh, more recently about the, the social capital, the transformation. Uh, on the, that community engagement and mobilization. 41 years ago, that's exactly what make, made us happen. That was the genesis of Eva and the community of Villa Victoria. Today, we find ourselves struggling in keeping the, uh, residents engaged, involved, participating actively in all the work that we do. And part of it, and there's a really good book and uh, uh, by Mario Small, who talks specifically about the transformation of social capital in Villa Victoria and the shift in generations. You know, if you talk to those people who were there 40 years ago, and there are very few, but there's still some of them in Villa Victoria, they will tell you, you know, they would describe how ugly it was. It was the ghetto, and now they see Villa Victoria as a beautiful community, as an oasis, whereas new generation and younger people that live there see it the way that generation saw the neighborhood 41 years ago. So there is that disconnect and that really, that difficulty in really translating and communicating this wonderful, rich ex history to new generations so they continue to be engaged. So that's another challenge. And I just want to conclude by saying that um, this conversation is very important. We have actually, I've talked to Jean, hundreds of tapes from Channel 6 uh, beta tapes in boxes and boxes and boxes and, and I think it is important for us we would love to re definitely archive and catalog those here as well so they stay because you know tomorrow there's a new sh set of people in these organizations and they decide that this is not important anymore and they may you know they
Maybe plus we don't have the necessary, you know, temperature control, et cetera, uh, kind of environment to really protect these kind of documents. But it's really, truly important for us not only to protect and preserve this information, but also to share it. So that's why I'm so happy and, and, and glad to be here. Thank you very much, everyone. nonprofit, public, and private sector management experience to Alianza Hispana. So she's a tremendous person to know. <laughs> Since 2004, Ms. Colazo has served as the Director of Finance and Administration and later as the Deputy Director of La Alianza Hispana. Prior to joining La Alianza, Ms. Colazo served as the Director of Finance for OISTE, a Massachusetts Latino political organization, and as Director of Finance and Administration for ROCA which is a nationally recognized youth empowerment agency in the Boston area. And as the manager for the Puerto Rico Power Electric Company. As a community leader, Ms. Colazo served on the organizing committee for the 2004 Democratic National Convention, Convention's Latino Party, and currently serves on the board of directors for the Action for Boston Community Develop Development Incorporated, ABCD, and the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you to all of you for putting this uh, event together. And also, uh, thank you to my colleagues. Always it's an honor to, to be in the sitting with um, people that really understand <laughs> the work that we do. Este, and, and I appreciate also Nelson Merced because former executive director of La Alianza Hispana. And Vanessa Calderón because is one of my colleagues that I, mo este, I admire a, a lot. As a woman, as a Puerto Rican, as, as, a, as an executive director, as a leader of this community that she's doing a lot. Uh, 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 for me, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and, and I feel very proud este, listening to Vanessa about the rich history that that, that organization and, and, and the community este, has, and what a dream was a dream, and now is a reality. Uh, I work for La Alianza Hispana, and, and, and two years ago, I started as, as the executive director. And I, I first went to Alianza Hispana four years ago. Um, they called me, the former executive director, Willy Rodriguez, asked me to go and help him um, because my background is in finance. And to see what can I do for that, that organization that on that moment was struggling. Uh, that's how I started learning about Alianza Hispana. And I got uh, in love with the work that they have been doing and the work that has happened for uh, right now 38 years already in the community of Rosemary. Uh, 30 years ago, a, a group of uh, two women, two women, and they were ESOL teachers uh, in the community of Rosemary, decided that looking at the condition that the, the community were living, especially <coughs> the Puerto Rican community also, um, they saw that the community was struggling a lot, and, and they didn't have uh, the ESOL education, they didn't have education, they didn't have jobs, um, they didn't have houses. And, and that, for them, that was not okay. And they said, we have to do something about it. We have to change this reality, okay, because we deserve better than that. And they start meeting together. I imagine them talking with a coffee and eating because we all if they meet and eat. everything is our own food, right? <laughs> uh, among the Latinos. And they, they start meeting and they start talking and they have this dream of creating this organization. And that dream came through. They approached this uh, wonderful man, Hubie Jones, uh, the, which uh, at that moment was the executive director of Rosemary Multi Service uh, in, in Rosemary, and, and he decided, an Afro American decided to help them they, uh, and, and to put this dream uh, and make that dream a reality. 
and he hired a wonderful woman, with which her name is Frida Garcia, and I'm sure that, uh, that a lot of you knows about her. And if you don't, please look at her and research, uh, because it's a wonderful woman that have done a lot uh, for this community. And not just for this community, but also uh, for the human rights and the, and the women's rights. Uh, uh, the, uh, and, and, and she was the, for, uh, the first executive, she became to be the first executive director of La Alianza Hispana. Since then, for 30, uh, 38 years, La Alianza Hispana has been well known. Uh, the, um, a lot of people see us as the portal for the immigrants, the Latino immigrants community in, in the city of Boston. It's the first place mostly where, where the, the Latino uh, when they come, they come to La, to La Alianza Hispana. And we have worked very hard to help them, to help the community to overcome the effects of poverty uh, through our programs. We focus on education, we have workforce and education program, we have a public health and mental health, and we also provide ser service for elders. Uh, and that still is the focus on, on these 38 years. Uh, for me, when I started two years ago, uh, I was glad that we had these records in place in the University of Northeastern, okay, in this library. Um, this was one of the f first places that I visited um, because I needed to understand, I needed to understand the huge responsibility that was taking on my shoulders. <laughs> okay, I needed to understand what happened during all these 38 years that this organization has been serving this community. Este, we have este, great moments, we have <laughs> moments, very deep challenges moments uh, in the history of La Alianza. But what makes uh, re resonate uh, on me was that for over 38 years, how many Latinos have gone through this agency? And how many Latinos the agencies have helped and had impact their life of them in this community? And I started looking at that and studying. And I saw and I discovered wonderful, a wonderful people that when they came, uh, uh, over, probably on that moment, on the 60s and the 70s, on the on the 80s, they came to this country not speaking the la language as I did 12 years ago. I didn't speak English. I came here to learn English, actually. And I think that that's the, the less, last thing that I have done. <laughs> 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 I, uh, because on that moment, I, I start knowing what the nonprofits do. And, and uh, when I was in Puerto Rico, I don't, uh, in Puerto Rico, we don't have so many nonprofits, and it's not something that uh, is big in, over there. And, and when I, I moved here, I, I start seeing the work, the tremendous work, and the impact that nonprofits has in the life of people, but not just in life of the people, but also in the politics of this city in the politics, in the, in the, in the uh, policies and regulations that are uh, written and, and, uh, by, the, by the politician, and how the nonprofits uh, have uh, a word to say on that, and actually how the nonprofits and the people that work for the nonprofits take an action, an activism, uh, in making sure that uh, the rights of the pe people are respected. And, 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 and how the nonprofits interact in a way that creates a, a force the system to have better education for our children, better education for our families, a better health system, creating a healthcare system here in Massachusetts, and have we make sure that we have the housing uh, for the families. That means that for me, being coming here and understanding the role that, that I was taking uh, as the executive director and understanding what the reality of the, of the Puerto Rican community and the Latino community in general had li been living for all these 38 years in, 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 in Boston and in Massachusetts in general. And how much we have grown 
and the impact that we have um, made in this city and this state, and like Vanessa said, in United States, because we are the faster growing population in this, not this city, but in the nation in general. Uh, it's very important to have this document in place to understand the reality of our community. If you understand what the past, you understand what happened with the Latino community, you understand why the Latino community is where it is right now and where we are heading. Okay, you can know history is so important to define your present and your future. Okay, and I think that that's very valuable. Have been for me as an executive director and a person that decided to take the responsibility on leading an agency and understanding because if I'm going to lead, I need to understand what the people need. Okay, what is happening with them? Why we are here today? What is este, and where we are going, and how I'm going to make decision because sometimes I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I said, I need just to look what happened and understand what I need to do right now because tremendous work happened on during all these 38 years. Tremendous work este, that I have to value that and I have to honor that. I have to honor a woman like Frida Garcia. I have to honor Nelson Merced. I have to honor all these executive directors that 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 for day and night work hard, okay, as I'm doing now, and took that responsibility in their shoulders to move the community este, forward, forward. And right now, to really help me to develop the roadmap of where I want this Latino community to go. Because I'm a key as an organization, La Alianza Hispana is an important este, a organization and entity in defining where the Latinos are going to be going este, and moving forward. And what, how I want to, este, that community to look like, what I want to create. And, and it's a huge responsibility for us is the, is understanding. Sometimes, um, actually, uh, I, I currently studying in the master program that you, the Northeastern University has in nonprofit. And, and it's very interesting when I have gone to the classes and when people, most of the people, does not understand what the nonprofit uh, the organizations are. Uh, they have different pers uh, uh, perception about the role and the work that we do in our communities. And, and sometimes I would like to invite everybody <laughs> to come to La Alianza just a couple of weeks and you are gonna, you are gonna understand uh, the, the work that we do every day, every day, trying to help and improve the, la of, uh, the, uh, the life of the children and the families uh, of this community in general, not just the Latino, but because sometimes we help other other cultures. Like uh, Roseberry, I need to understand the growth at the, in the Cape Verdean community right now. Then I need to learn about the Cape Verdean community and what that means we all living together in a sector and what that means for us to understand the health issues, the health that. Uh, uh, it's the issues that are affecting the, our community and how I'm going to be this instrument to help to create better policies the, uh, and, and to help and, 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 and probably right now the, uh, the frame the health system that is going to be uh, putting together in here in, in Boston, Massachusetts. That means that este, I'm not going to talk a little bit more about the history of La Alianza Hispana because I'm glad that Nelson Mercedes was here and, and, and talk and explain to you uh, the different roles that La Alianza has played in the life of uh, in this community, like creating, creating three of the most powerful organizations that today exist, like Nuestra, este, DSNI, and Casa Esperanza three wonderful uh, non-profit organizations that, that happens to be part of a growth from La Alianza Hispana. I have seen a lot of leaders that today they are playing, people that came to this country, to came to this city 
um, with no school, with no degrees, with no knowing what to do, with no housing, and how La Alianza Hispana helped them to now become the leaders este, that they are in different aspects. We have people that have played a, a key role in the education reform here in, in, in Massachusetts. We have people in different roles este, that La Alianza had helped them uh, to become those leaders that they are today like, like La Alianza is doing with me. Thank you so much and I hope that this helped you. <laughs> question and answers, so I'm glad um, all of you are still here, ready to ask questions. Emily is going to help pass the mic around as needed, so feel free to raise your hand um, when you want to, to ask your question. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Josiah Martinez and I uh, work with Janet in Alianza Hispana. And I was listening to all of you, Nelson, you did a wonderful job um, talking about the history of La Alianza, and Vanessa also did a wonderful job. But I was wondering, um, something that I did not hear is about the economic climate that we're living right now, and how nonprofit organizations like La Alianza are dealing. I know from the, my personal experience in La Alianza that we're going through a lot right now, and Janet did not say that, but one of the things that we might also want to communicate to you is that we're looking forward to have people collaborating with us. Uh, we're looking forward for volunteers. I know Gabriela Cáceres already uh, show up over there and she's going to be helping us with our Latino Health Festival on, on July or probably later on, depending on the economic climate. But I would like uh, the two of you to, to kind of um, talk a little bit about what is, uh, what can uh, organizations like La Alianza do uh, in the face of such uh, economic climate? <laughs> I'm dreaming every night and I, bro, bro, well, I don't know if I'm dreaming because honestly I'm not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> so that's wrong. I'm not sleeping. It, uh, um, I think that we as agencies are living a moment um, that is very, uh, it's very difficult because I don't see that this nation had experienced something like this probably since 1920 or something, 1930, and I was not around. That means that I have taken a lot of courses and <laughs> I, study, I have studied a lot about finance courses and, and leadership and what to do in difficult times but no one has explained to me what to do right now. And, and I think that we all are figuring and trying to figure out this. I think that what um, a, the agency, like, like me as an executive director, I'm trying to be proactive. I'm trying to see if the, uh, what can I do with the resources that I have. Uh, we nonprofits always have been asked to do more with less and we are going to be to ask to do more, 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 with much less. And I think that we cannot uh, lose the, 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 our perspective right now. And our per perspective is the, our community. I think that we're going to be living moments where our services are going to be much needed. I think that our, especially education, is going to be key. It's going to be in very important for our community. Uh, our children, the youth are killing themselves just across the street, okay? Around the corner, youth are killing themselves. And, and families are suffering. We are starting to see, and we, because we do mental health, we are starting to see an increase in, in violence, in crimes, uh, depression, that is, uh, especially Latino communities, number one. <laughs> In, in those factors, and, and that means that it's very important that we keep offering our services to our community and, um, and uh, that we pay attention to what is happening to them and that we are proactive. 
uh, uh, what this exercise helped me to see when I saw those view and when I see these records is that these people were living in over 30 years ago. They did they they were looking at the, the, the whole situation. I imagine them not sleeping because it was so hard, it's so so difficult for them. And 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 but they didn't stop. They start thinking, they start strategizing and, and they start developing different services to help the community to be better, okay? And we are in, and, and they have something very important, and it was hope. It was hope. And I think that at this moment, on this moment, I need that and I have that. I know that we are living challenging moment, but we have hope. We are gonna see a change, but it's gonna be difficult. But it's gonna require the effort of everybody. We need to collaborate. We need to collaborate individuals, organizations, institutions, government. We all together can collaborate to uh, and, 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 and find a way to be successful uh, in this situation. Our people need us more than ever. Um, I think um, <clears throat> uh, it's a difficult situation right now, uh, but every time the Latino community has, not, has often faced difficult situations, uh, and even though this is probably the most challenging that I've seen, at least in my lifetime, um, and I think a key, uh, and I'm going to be fairly narrow, because uh, I think I, I, when I said institution building, the reason why I think it's, in, it's important is because it out, you know, it's an organization that outlasts the moment. And so I think the essential thing for Alianza or for uh, IBA or for any of the organizations is to be good managers of the resources that they have and they have to be visionaries. They have to be able to see beyond the moment. Uh, because, you know, this will pass, like all other times have passed. And we have to be ready uh, with the strategies that allows us to take advantage of those new opportunities. And, you know, I think it's difficult, but it's a balancing act. And uh, the key to that is to have a strong financially strong institution that knows where the resources are, knows where the resources are being invested and employed, and can be make the tough decisions that need to be made when the resources are reduced, and able to mobilize the community to advocate for more resources. Um, you know, I think that every time we face a situation like this, uh, I think the community has, you know, has been mobilized and has demanded that the services that are necessary for that community be implemented and be implemented effectively. Another question. Hi, my name is Rosa Rodriguez Williams. I'm the director of the Latino Center here at uh, Eastern. I work with Rebecca, and she's, isn't she amazing? She's yeah. done such a great job. <laughs> but I, I did, and I wish um, there was more students here um, because I do want to talk about what Vanessa said earlier about social capital and um, the power of a voice. I mean, I think in this historic election year, we've seen what a group of people who want change can really do in a country, whether you were for or against Barack Obama, you have to see what he did. And that was united people of all levels, of all colors. And it was built on that hope. I work with amazing students day in and day out. They inspire me. They teach me, we work together, and you wanna talk about hope. These young people have it. And when you talk about collaborating and reaching out to one another, if we look back at 30, 40 years, that's what you see, is people coming together. And I think as a community, because I, I see it, uh, you know, my center was built on the struggle of young people here that needed to have it, there wasn't one, you know, it's pretty young, it's 10 years old. Um, but they made it happen. 
And because these things, and a lot of these students haven't been part of that struggle, at times we can see it being taken for granted or the things that are there. But when you hear stories of struggles, when you, have, you are preserving these stories, I think that's what inspire us to come together and work together and move forward. And I think if there's any a time to do that, it is right now in the economic crisis that we're in, I have had to scale down in, in the things that I'm doing. I see a colleague of mine at another institution who's also here and working with you. I think what we can do with the little bit that everyone can put together, it's amazing. And so I want to encourage my students that have been here, that have heard this story, to, come, to work in collaboration, to you know, listen to Gabby's story and what she's experiencing as part of La Alianza to come to our um, event in the summer and see the elderly um, folks that you work with at La Alianza that come here for our summer barbecue that we that have so much knowledge. In essence, I just want to put that call out and I welcome a conversation between you and I. We talked earlier as well as Vanessa and Nelson, you're far, but hey, we'll come to Washington, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think that it's really necessary for young people to see what the struggle was and to be that forward thinking and see what the struggle can become if we don't take care of what we've had now. So I guess my, my question, if I have one, because I can get on a soapbox and talk for hours too, um, is how do you see us building such a thing? How are, are you know, your young people within your community that may be younger, that can be mentored by some of the students here at Northeastern or services that you have? In essence, what can we do together as a community. And, and when I call, I'm not talking about just Latino, and that's my call here on this campus all the time. It's not about just Latino. Look at Barack Obama's campaign. Look what this country did. And it wasn't just one type of person. It was a lot of people coming together. So I just want to get that sense from you. Yeah. No, I, I, I really think that it's a lot of work to do, OK? And I think that we, like I said, we are facing a huge challenge. Okay, uh, we are living a very difficult moment. Okay, and it's not a bubble, it's a reality. O sea, when I said that youth are killing each other at the corner, they are killing, it's, it's a reality. You don't see in the papers. Okay, but that is happening. That's just a couple of streets. And why? Why? Because they don't have, sometimes, they don't have someone to talk to. They don't have someone to talk to. Este, here in Alianza, I'm going to invite everybody mm -hmm. uh, because at the same time, I'm scaling, uh, scaling down. I have to scale down. Uh, and and this, this is a risk. Um, this is a risk. Uh, I just have to lay off uh, five positions. And, and that was a very difficult decision for me. But I needed to make that decision or do that or then affect um, the agency that is so important for the community, especially now. And, 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 and right now I'm gonna need and depend on volunteers. I think that is a time for volunteers to come to the agencies, not just to La Alianza Hispana. Just look what your interests are. But I'm telling you, La Alianza Hispana, we need, we have, we ha I have an after school program. Those kids usually, and I, they are by, by themselves because their parents have three jobs, okay, in order to survive. They have three jobs. The only place they don't have anyone. They have us, okay, and we are there. When they finish the classes, we are there helping them because they have been brought in this country for one year, two years, okay. That's the way we need tutors. We are helping them to succeed in their school. And if you see the result, when you see the result, and how much they are learning, and how much they are increasing, then oh, say, uh, it's going to open your heart, OK? When you can be just 15 minutes, you don't need, to, you don't need too much. You, one hour of your time, you can change those lives. When you go to the elders program, most of the elders, they don't have family members. They are living by themselves. The only place they have to have fun and to have someone to talk to them is our program in Mission Hill. We are just, we are seeing, I think that is two just elders for Latino, okay, in Massachusetts. Okay, we are just one in Boston. 
O sea, look how you can help them. They love when you go and you walk and just say hi and you talk to them and you uh, teach them something. Now I have someone volunteering doing Tai Chi with them. They are doing Tai Chi and you know what? Doing Tai Chi, they have increased, improved the, uh, the, the, the heart pressure. Can you believe that? And elders, they are doing Tai Chi, not the younger, because I have problem with the younger doing the Tai Chi. Okay? <laughs> I, I said, let me see if they do the same. Uh -huh. But uh, so, uh, they do it. Uh, the adults, I have 150 adults learning English, learning English, learning computers. Why? Just, just something as simple as that they cannot communicate with their children right now. Can you imagine not being able to communicate? communicate with your children? Can you imagine not being able to help your children to do, to do your assignment? We are helping them. And we are helping them. We are going to teach them also ESOL class in, the, in one of the manufacturing company. Because they don't know, they don't have time to go out and take classes, but then I'm sending a teacher over there. And I have 50 students over there, okay, <laughs> learning Sorry, English. Anymore. And they're doing great in their jobs right now. They are improving, the produ production is improving, and the owners are very happy, okay? And we have, I have a volunteer now teaching GED classes to them, just a volunteer, because I don't have money, more money. I said, the money has been shrink in this economy, but we still being there, we are being there for them, and you can be there. 15 minutes of your time, 30 minutes, one hour, we can do a lot. Also, use your resources. That's a great practice. If you want to learn something, a nonprofit is the best place for you to learn. You know, strategic planning, doing the outcomes and measurement, evaluation. So, say, uh, that's a way for you to create a project that will be very beneficial for us as a nonprofit. Because sometimes we don't have the resources to pay for that. O sea, we are stretched and our community need us. And it's not our community because we are that community also. We are part of that community. Uh, is Rosa still? Rosa still. Colón? Uh, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a little story about Rosa Colón and technology. Because uh, I was the first, uh, when I was the executive director of La Alianza, I was the first uh, executive director to introduce uh, microcomputers uh, to Alianza and Rosa Colon was completely scared of the microcomputers but if it wasn't uh, thank God for that she had twins who were in the Madison Park High at the time I think it's called something yeah. else now uh, basically taught her how to how to use the microcomputer and then she became like the, the ace, the star, on how to use microcomputers. So, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it tells a little bit about my age here. Uh, but <laughs> I feel like a dinosaur. But I just wanted to basically, you know, second uh, what Janet has said. I think it's important that you exercise some of your own energy and some of your volunteer time and some of your spare time to really help out some of our organizations. And I think she was very eloquent at, at, at saying and demonstrating the kind of the opportunities and, and that exist. Uh, I also want to make a plug for the fact that it's important for you to be successful at the university and for you to do the work that you're doing because we need your knowledge and energy. Uh, because, you know, I mean, you know, look, right now in front of us is an iPod with a microphone. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's incredible. That, that somebody can, can tape what we are doing on an iPod with a microphone. And I tell you that as much as, the, as, much as agencies have, they don't have this type of advanced technology. Okay? Even though maybe uh, Janet is walking around with an iPod. Or, but in reality, there is something to be said about the knowledge and the skills that you already have that can be very useful uh, in introducing new ways of thinking because I think part of what we need to do in the future is that we have to take the problems that we're facing today and like the people uh, that organized that EVA and like the people that organized 
Alianza. What they were doing is taking the technology that they had available at that time and created a vision that then they could implement. Uh, and so that knowledge that you're developing here in Northeastern, uh, supplemented by volunteer work uh, at Alianza and Arriba, I think is important for us as a community to tap into. That knowledge, that skills, those forward-thinking uh, thoughts and plans and visions that you have are going to be important for our uh, community. So I want to just put a plug in for making sure that you do your work here well. Mm -hmm. And this will be on YouTube, so everybody will get to hear the history. Yeah. Out on <laughs> show, show, and on YouTube. Show, showing soon, soon on YouTube near you. Okay. So let, let me bring this evening's uh, wonderful event to a close now. Thank you all for coming and for participating. But thank you particularly for these inspirational and wonderful devoted people who've been talking to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.